Hi, it's Jason from Fraser Valley Rose Farm, and I'd like to explore a question with you. Can you own a plant? And I'm not talking about physically owning a plant to put in the garden. I'm talking about the idea of a plant. Can you put a patent on its DNA, say, or its growing characteristics? Now, whether your initial gut reaction to that is a hell no, or a qualified yes, please stick around for the conversation because I have a feeling you're not going to like where this is going. In order for me to talk about this most recent development, I feel like we have to go back to the compromise that was reached about a hundred years ago involving, of all people, Thomas Edison, the great inventor. He testified before Congress in the 1920s and talked about how you had to have a commercial interest in the things that you invent to incentivize further invention. That obviously made sense for the things that he was working on, but he argued that it could work well for plant breeding as well. He said he felt sure that this would create a whole generation of Burbanks, and by Burbank he meant Luther Burbank, a plant breeder uh, prominent in the early 20th century who bred many well-known plants including the Shasta Daisy and the Burbank Russet Potato, among many, many others, but never had any patents on his inventions. And the problem with that situation was that a person could work on a plant for many, many years, put in all the breeding and development, but the first time that he or she sold that plant, uh, somebody could take a cutting and then equally benefit from it. So it didn't confer any exclusive benefit upon the breeder, and that took away all of the financial incentive to continue on with those breeding efforts. So the compromise that Congress eventually struck, and it was mirrored in laws around the world, was something called the Plant Patent Act. It was passed in 1930, four years after Luther Burbank's death, so it didn't help him. Uh, but what it did is it established the financial framework for patents on plants going forward. And as I say, it was a bit of a compromise. What it did is it gave a 20 year period. It said that if you breed a plant, or invent a plant, that anybody else is restricted from asexual propagation, that is taking a cutting, cloning it, budding it, uh, or modern days it might be tissue culture. So those kinds of asexual propagation methods were barred, but importantly it didn't stop other people from having access to the genetics of that plant through sexual breeding. So. Uh, the first plant like this was, that was uh, that was patented was actually in my garden today is the rose called New Dawn. Now using that one as an example, if New Dawn is patented, even within that patent period, if I as an amateur rose breeder went along and pollinated that plant and then used its offspring, got a, a little baby rose from there, uh, that one was free to be bred with. This was in fact the most single most important portion of that compromise I talked about, that while well, it did allow for the financial incentive to the plant breeders that the gene pool remained open for all for the benefit of humanity kind of calling it an open source or, or community pool of plant genes that anybody could work with. Now I'll put that in rose terms because that's the area of growing plants that I'm most familiar with, but what it meant is that a rose bred by Cordes, the German breeder, could then be used in the breeding lines of David Austin or Meyland, and one bred by Meyland could be used by Weeks roses in California. So the breeders could actually exchange this genetic information without much delay, with the, just from one generation of plant to seedling and onward, and it wasn't restricted to professional breeders, it could be used openly for amateur breeders to great effect. Many of the innovations that we've had in rose history have been built on amateur breeding programs. So that was the deal, and that was for the better part of a hundred years, the deal, but now that deal has been challenged, and it comes in the form of a different kind of patent, a utility patent. A utility patent isn't like the plant patent we just discussed. What it would do is it would restrict breeding from the resulting plant. A utility patent is normally describing a chemical process or a mechanical innovation, uh, but in 1980 there was a court case that actually allowed them to use this on man-made organisms, microorganisms, and that kind of opened the door to saying that they could grant a patent on plants as a living thing. Now in the years since that court ruling, you could primarily describe this as a big egg issue. It mostly came up in discussions about GMOs or transgenic organisms uh, like corn or soy that were genetically 
uh, modified to be herbicide resistant and kind of restricted people from breeding within those genetic lines, which is a completely different debate and very heated on its own. But what's recently happened is this has come home to roost in the, uh, let's say, mainstream plant community. It's come back to roses. The first patent was on a rose. Now this new patent is a different kind of patent. It's a utility patent on a rose of all things, placed by star roses on petite knockout. So in the case of Petite Knockout, what exactly are they saying that they have in invented? And what it comes down to is they have a plant that is a genetic dwarf, a small rose that is repeat blooming, has black spot resistance and double red flowers. Now, none of those things on their own are very novel within roses. What their argument is, is that they could put place a utility patent on this, combining the four different growing attributes and saying, that's what we own. We own a particular set of genes that create a combination of those four growing attributes. Now, is that defensible? Well, legally, they can place the utility patent and they have been granted that utility patent. Uh, the question of whether they would sue somebody, whether they would prevail in that lawsuit, that's an open question, but placing the utility patent in the first place is what puts them in a position to do that. Now I want you to sit on this for a minute and wonder, well, where did they come up with all of the genes that went into this particular plant? And the answer to that is that by generation by generation by generation, all of that came from the shared community gene pool that makes up all of roses. So up to this point has been free for anybody to use. And somehow by mixing that in their own particular way, they ended up with these qualities, which now they are claiming, even though each one of them individually is a very common rose breeding program goal, but putting them all together, that's a patent and you're restricted from using this, but importantly locks away that gene pool or whatever genes went into that plant from being used in anybody else's breeding. So the analogy I'd use is they used the ladder of all of the community genes that have been developed over the years to get to a certain destination and then they've used the utility patent to kick down the ladder so nobody else can use it. Now I'm not going to mince words, I think this is a dangerous precedent and the way I'm going to make that you, you understand that is by giving the example of a rose that was recently bred. In 1992 or so, Len Scrivens from the UK, an amateur breeder, used again existing genetics within the whole gene pool of roses to create a rose called Baby Love and of course other breeders looked at the qualities of that rose, uh, strong colour, great uh, health, and said well that would be good in my program. And, famous rose breeders, people the caliber of Christian Bedard, Tom Carruth, Chris, Chris Warner, uh, really famous and influential breeders used them in very big roses like Home Run with that line there or the Brinda Bella roses from Australia. Uh, all of these used the baby love genetics to get where they were going and that was free for use because there was no utility patent placed on that rose. And imagine now what would have happened if that utility patent approach had been used on important roses throughout the history of roses, things like the Peace Rose or Iceberg, which both became super important parents. And what's next? If you can own a trait or at least the specific DNA that brings to, that is combined together to create a trait, what can they own? And I think about the, uh, let's say the community project now that is aiming towards rose rosette disease resistant roses uh, somebody might land on the specific combination of genes that get this together but they're not going to do it alone they're going to do it with the entire pool of dna that rose breeders amateur and professional have worked on for many many years and if somebody lands on that i don't want them to put on a utility patent so that combination of genes is locked away from development from the rest of the rose world so that gives you a background on the topic. I, I guess my point of view on the initial plant patent thing, the 20 year protection on asexual propagation is that at least it aimed to be a relatively uh, balanced compromise, allowing the profitability on a particular plant for a particular amount of time before it entered back into the public domain and belonged to everybody. This new approach does threaten to lock away genetics for a much, much longer period of time, slow innovation amongst amateur and professional rose breeders, and really just be a bad precedent for plants overall. That's my opinion on it. Do I hold it against star roses? Well, I mean, lawyers are gonna do what lawyers are gonna do, and they'll do what they can get away with. Myself, I probably will not buy the plant. It's kind of an interesting uh, question of what do you do with that? You don't want to encourage that kind of bad behavior within the industry. Be interested to know your thoughts on this. Can a person own the idea or the traits of or the DNA of a particular plant? 
Leave that down in the comments below the video and thanks so much for watching.